to this edition of FTAC. This is the this is the 11th of a nearly annual series that started. Uh, it's an unofficial meeting in the year 2000 at Aluka. Organized and uh, the more formal FTEC 1 was held in 2001, and then the FTEC 2 was at an NCR facility in UP. And of course, it has been going on uh, almost once every year, so this is the 11th. And um, this year, with uh, the attendance is larger than in most years, as Naresh was pointing out, and that's probably because we have so many interested students in this center itself. Now I invite Professor Shivaji Raha, our director, to inaugurate the Field Theoretic Aspects of Gravity Conference for this year. Thank you, Professor Lahiri, and a warm welcome to all of you to this 11th uh, meeting on the Field Theoretic Aspects of Gravity. And this year it's particularly relevant because of the recent discovery of the gravitational wave. So it's uh, indeed a pleasure that we are able to host it at Essendon Center this year. And uh, I see a large number of young faces, which is an extremely heartening uh, situation. And I don't have much to contribute in the sense of uh, technical aspects of the conference here today, but I'm sure it will be a very pleasant experience and I wish you great fun and <coughs> learning experience during the next few days. So once again, on behalf of all my colleagues at Dyson Bose Center, I extend to you a very warm welcome and wish this conference a great success. Thank you, Professor Raha. And now I invite Professor Naresh Dadij to say a few words and chair the session. Thank you, Anita. It's uh, on behalf of uh, all of us. I wish to thank the Assembly Center, the Director, and Anita for organizing this this meeting. And which, as uh, Anita said, that started informally in 2000, and it's nice to see that it has picked up, and we have been meeting regularly and going to various places. The basic idea was not a, a formal meeting, but it's a more a meeting which is more uh, discussion-oriented and center, where we don't want, well, the original idea was we don't want a finished idea, but something which you are working on and evolving. And in a small group, people essentially work in the place. So uh, initial meetings used to be too intensive in discussions many times that before the, before the speaker starts, there were questions. So well, it has now leveled down. And, uh, from the blackboard, we have come down to the PowerPoints, which is to not much focus to the liking of the older ones generation like me. But anyway, now without much ado, the idea. discussion and ideas 
as a focus of this kind of meeting. So we in fact prefer the kind of meetings to be held in a place where there is no email, there is no uh, all this internet, nothing will be available, that kind of places. But slowly we have mellowed down also and this is the status. Now uh, I'm going to talk about uh, certain issues uh, about eight states, horizons, black holes, etc. But uh, before I, in fact, part of the talk I am <coughs> using from my last FTAG meeting one year back, uh, even though it is some of you would have attended and uh, don't jump on me that you have spoken about it last time. But there are a lot of new students. But anyhow, I'm going to be very brief about that because what I'm going to do now involves a connection to what was done earlier, an improvement, and further changes. So to that extent, uh, there will be some overlap, but we can say at least for 10 minutes. So this is my plan of the talk. And uh, I'll give some, as I mentioned earlier, Number one, two, three, four. These four things I have already talked about. Now, I'm going to be very brief about this, okay? Because many of these ideas are again used in my further activities, five, six, seven. But before eight, which I have, I have, I was uh, included uh, another two slides on something which I'm doing. So all my recent works are there are some completed work, like five, and six and seven, and eight, which I'm going to speak, not the conclusion part, are things which I'm doing now, it's not yet published. It's in fact, we are not even sent it, so it's being discussed. So that is the level at which it's going to be there. But unfortunately, to go to these later sections, I do need to specify, at least set the background, what is required, so the one, two, three, four, which I'm going to have, is basically an introduction to that part. So now, the manifolds with boundary is one thing which I've been bothered about for several years, for the past maybe seven, eight years. Now, I essentially, whenever we did the electrodynamics, etc., we said boundary conditions, etc. Well, essentially, we want to solve differential equations and then we put appropriate boundary conditions. Now, the, 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 most of the time it is based on physical reason, on what is the boundary conditions we put, and then what is it we expect, etc. But, so, in, while doing this, we have to go a little further. Is our physical reasoning is limited, or can we extend it, go beyond, and what are the new things that can come? is a question which I strive to look at. So this is the result of some of these things. Now, in a sense, the boundary or manifold boundary, these are all questions which should be asked at the deeper level whenever we take issues of gravity involving space-time, particularly even when talking about quantizing gravity kind of statements. So it requires further refinement and understanding in going to that. So that is a motivation to enlarge the scope of doing many of these things. And surprisingly, the issues here, which is some boundary of some bulk, that generically arises, it states localized at the bound. That is a new thing which I'm going to point out. Where is it coming from? How is it coming from? Is what I'm going to say. So if you have horizon, as a boundary, then there are some edge states on the horizon. Or if you have quantum all effect, then uh, with some topological behaviors, etc., on a boundary, there are edge states there also. And several other places where some of these things do arise, and where do they come from is the point which I'm going to talk about. So there is a very nice quotation, which and I was bothered about it, <laughs> came from Wolfgang Pauli, who said, God made my, actually I made a slight twist. He didn't say exactly in those words because he never used manifolds. So he said, God made bulk materials and then uh, the devil put the boundaries. So this is a kind of a thing so which plays a crucial role 
where what you do at the boundary can affect what is happening inside also, and that is what I'm going to point out. Okay, this is my motivational statement, and uh, I'm, I was surprised because when I prepared my talk last, sometime some two months back for a place, Tata Institute, then there was a talk, there was an article in one of the uh, magazines where my friends Sumit Das and Spencer wrote in Frontline about Nambu. He said that it, they believed in uh, physics without boundaries. Now, actually, I believe in physics with boundaries, and that is where the new life is coming from. Okay, so this is going to be my focus. We are interested in what is happening at the boundary if I do a quantum mechanical system. It can be as simple as a particle on a manifold with boundary, quantum mechanical issues. I can do quantum field theory on manifolds with boundary. And uh, I can do even electromagnetic theories, QED on manifolds with boundary, or gravity on manifolds with brown boundary. So these are the issues which I'm going to bother about. So this is my, as I said, this I'm going to rush through fast for only five minutes. So this is the thing that we are interested in, what we call normally as self-adjoint operators of Hamiltonian in quantum mechanics. Why is it? Because self-adjoint operators Generally, for observables, they provide for us real eigenvalues which are measured in experiment. These things we have to quantify a little more, but I will not focus on that. <laughs> Secondly, as a Hamiltonian is leading to time evolution operator, we need the unitary evolution of the states, and that requires the Hamiltonian to be self -adjoint. So these are basically the motivation why we are interested in self adjoint so this is the first thing. The next is, I'm going to give a simple example where things can go wrong. In fact, uh, whenever I do quantum mechanics class, I ask students to come with some simple particle in a box problem and ask them to compute some very simple things, which they start and immediately get the wrong answer. The first thing is they get the wrong answer. Then I have to tell them where is it happening. I'm not going to do that exercise, but I'll tell you what some of these things can play a role here. So free Hamiltonian, which I have as d squared by dx squared, on a particle in a box from minus a to plus a. Okay? If I try to do quantum theory, I have to tell clearly what is the boundary condition I'm going to put at the two boundaries. Now, generically we do, okay, that I will put drive function vanishing here and drive function vanishing here and try to compute. And that is not wrong. It is one of the things which is allowed. But there are more general things which are actually quantum mechanically it is allowed, which will make the operator which I have given as d squared by dx squared as self adjoint operators. What are the boundary conditions that are allowed are given by a theory which was given by Von Neumann, which I'm not going to explain right now. It is essentially says that number 2, 2, which I have written down, sorry. The 2, 2, which I have written down, is essentially try to solve that equation, find the eigenvalues, don't bother with the boundary conditions, put plus or minus i times psi whether there are solutions for that equation. Minus d squared by dx squared is equal to plus or minus i times i. How many independent such solutions are there will tell me that. So essentially, if you give me the wave function at the boundary plus a, and its derivative at the boundary, psi of a, psi prime of a, you have psi of minus a and psi prime of minus a, you write these two things as a column, if there is a unitary matrix which is linking them, that is a valid set of boundary condition you can have for the theory. That's what is the result of that. That is a little more complicated exercise. I'm going to do this thing, which is very simple. I call a particle in a line, semi-line, from zero to infinity. Zero to infinity, which is my, uh, this equation on R plus. And I ask the question, what is, is it self-adjoint? Answer is, yes, it can be made self-adjoint, provided I tell what is the value at the boundary, which is my origin, and its derivative at the origin. So that is what I'm going to explain in my next slide. Example is this simple. 
I solve this problem. If psi of x and psi prime of x are related by the count, that is the value at psi prime at origin and value at origin, the derivative on this are related by parameter kappa. Now this simple introduction is very, very interesting because the kappa which I have introduced is a length parameter. It has the dimensions of length because it is psi prime which is appearing here. So because of that, this has solution, and the solution is here, 2k kappa times e power minus kx, and this energy value is minus kappa square. Oh God, this is actually a free particle, and it is supposed to be bound close to the boundary, which is my origin. So it has a bound state with this eigenvalue, and it is localized close to the boundary, and there is a solution for your problem. So this is the bound state which I have remarked here. And this simple exercise which I have done, I can complicate it more for arbitrary manifolds. <coughs> arbitrary manifolds, compact <coughs> manifolds. And that kind of an analysis was done by my friends, Azori et al. I'm not going to talk about it now again because of lack of time. But I'm going to take one exercise, and surprisingly that gave a new result, which probably I have given in the, the FTAG meeting, but there are a lot of new students, I will mention it again here. What is the new result? I'm going to talk about a Laplace two-dimensional plane. I remove a disk out of it and try to solve my equation. Now, this is the equation. Now, the question is, what is the boundary condition? We tell normally, I will take a uh, Dirichlet boundary condition or Neumann boundary condition at the boundary. Now you can solve that. But that is not the most general boundary condition. And a general boundary, what I'm writing is also not the most general, but it is good for rotational invariance of the problem. Now I write the dn here as a normal derivative, and the wave function of the boundary. These are two things. And they are related, they are not independent. This is not 0, this is not 0 but they are related by this thing, and they are called Robin boundary conditions. Now, lo and behold, this changes the problem immediately. This kappa which I have introduced, as I mentioned earlier, has the dimensions of inverse length. Okay? Inverse of length is the parameter which I have introduced, and I have one more parameter which is the boundary, which is the radius of the disk itself, Rb. Now you find this problem is easy to solve, and the answer is very simple. The, they are all given by Bessel functions. Solutions are given by Bessel functions. And the solutions are actually here. This is the solution which you have, Bessel function. They should obey this boundary condition. This is the boundary condition which I have written down earlier. Now you find there are a number of solutions, m, the number n, okay, for different values of this n you can find out whether it satisfies this equation or not. And you find that there is a maximum value of n for which this satisfies. Beyond that, it doesn't satisfy that equation. And I'll show you by a graph itself that it is happening. But the next interesting result about that value n up to which it is satisfied is simply it is proportional to the radius Rb. So it is the circumference of the circle that many bound states are there for this problem. The circumference of the disk. So how do I find that this is a thing? So what I'm going to do is I will treat this as x some constant. This is some constant. And this root lambda is the eigenvalue. And wherever you this function as a function and this function, two functions, left hand side and right hand side, intersect, you get the solution. So the graphs are here. For different values of n, the actual value of the function is going like this. When the number n is greater than 10, you find that it does not cut it at all in this example. So, you probably mentioned this, but Rb in what units? Hmm? Rb? Rb? There must be some other scale, right? No, kappa is the another scale. That's all. These are the only scale. I'm just having Rb. And kappa. These are the two length parameters in the case. Yeah, but you're trying to maximize n, which is a number, in terms of Rb. So if not, uh, what are, okay, let me, let, me go, let me go back. 
What I am doing is, I, I plot this right hand side for one value k1. The k1 curve is the first curve which I have. This curve is k1. Okay? k2 is the next curve. It starts at 2. k3 is that. So this is the right hand side is of this equation is what I have plotted on the one curve. The next curve which I am going to do is kappa. This is the, kappa is a constant. Why is it called kappa is a constant? What is it, lambda? Lambda is the eigenvalue where it will cut. It will cut the point where, for example, sorry. So the lambda is for k1, this is the value, k2, this is the value. So many values of lambda is available. So this is a function of lambda. Ah, that's what I am doing. So it is the, those many eigenvalues are there for this problem and that is finite in number. So this is the interesting thing that it is proportional to the circumference of the circle. Now I do this exercise for three dimensions. I remove a bar. I do the exercise for that and lo and behold we enter. As you expected, it is proportional to the area of the surface. Okay? It is simple, as simple as that. And then I immediately, okay, oh, it looks like something like black hole, because that was my motivation. And I relate this to black hole issues, which are there. And the answer is yes, in some sense I can relate it. But black hole geometry is given by a different metric, it's not a flat metric, etc. I have to do that exercise more. Okay? So that is what was my motivation. But before going to that, I did one more exercise. Is it really proportional to the circumference of the circle, or circumference of the curve, which I'm doing, so I did the exercise with elliptical disk. Answer, I will not explain all these things because it was very interestingly the so-called Helmholtz problem can be solved exactly in some 13 quad curvilinear coordinates. Okay? And one such coordinate is elliptical coordinates. So I took that as an exercise and tried to do for elliptical disk. Answer is it is not proportional to the circumference of the ellipse. It is proportional to the circumference the biggest circle I can inscribe in it. Okay? So this is the result, which is what I have here. It is the minor axis is the biggest circle I can inscribe, and that is the number which will decide by that. So this is sort of related to what I realized by talking to people, what people call the Gromov's non-squeezing theorem. It's actually a question like this thing. You take a camel and squeeze it through a needle. Can you do it? Answer is yes. If you are allowed to do all possible diffeomorphisms with that camel, you can do it. But I tell you that camel has a surface, two-dimensional surface, and you can do only symplectic translations. Can you do that? Is a question. Answer is you cannot. So this is a thing which is called non-squeezing theorem. Can you squeeze the camel inside a middle? Not if you are not allowed only symplectic transformations. And it's something like uncertainty in classical mechanics itself, in classical statistical mechanics. Now let me go to the next exercise. So I did this exercise with a simple like, thing which I know, which is BGZ black hole. And this is also I'm not going to explain in detail because I don't want to, I want to go to the other issues which I'm taking. But anyhow I'll mention, the question is are there head states in this problem? So I solved this exercise, this is a metric and this is a plain order equation I'm trying to write down. And then I solve this in top-twice coordinates. And the top-twice coordinate problem becomes ordinary simple Schrodinger equation problem with in top-twice Okay? And again, only thing is there is a potential. Potential is well behaved at the origin, which is r star is equal to zero, or this thing. And there is no problem here. And this is my boundary condition, Robin boundary condition, which allows for the edge states which are there. But the solutions become fairly rapidly oscillating close to that. And to estimate how many solutions are there becoming difficult. But we did estimate, but it agrees with the results which we have been expecting in this problem. OK. So this is, again, uh, only for entertainment purpose. So I considered R2 minus this as cancer gas of particles. <laughs> what is it? That is, because now I have energy, negative energy states, maybe one or two, depending on the choice of the kappa which I'm choosing. And the answer is, yes, they can be stabilized provided number of particles, density of particles, like Bose-Einstein condensate, 
is this is the room of bosons. So the Bose-Einstein concept is saving the situation of instability in conventional thing, and the same thing will happen here. But it is not close to zero, but at a finite temperature. So this is the next Bose-Einstein condensate issue is the one which is there. Okay, the next one is uh, about uh, quantum field theory. If I do quantum field theory on R2 minus this, is it stable? Is it fine? Answer is it cannot be because if I expand this in modes, these are nice modes, there's no problem. They are E power minus IKX kind of modes, plane wave modes. But these are also there. The other solutions are also there. And if I do path integral with that, it will block. Okay, because there are negative energy modes. So what, what do I do? I do simply go to Euclidean path integral. And I want to make sure that this is finite or nice. I do, instead of doing a zero temperature, I do a finite temperature. If I do a finite temperature, then there is much bar of frequency, omega n, which is given here. And then I have to do this expansion here. And the interesting thing, I will just quote the results now, because this is all something which was published earlier, and I have talked about it. The interesting thing is, quantum field theory can be made stable at finite temperature if the temperature is greater than some value. Now, this is not surprising for us. The result is, the temperature is greater than some value. You will find the, the quantum field theory is stable and nice. Uh, functional path integrals are nice. Everything is nice. And the reason is simple. For, for example, if I do quantum field theory on R2 or R3, conventional space times, it is stable as long as the temperature is greater than zero or equal to zero. Zero is a third law of thermodynamics. You cannot cross it. Now the third law of thermodynamics new for this problem is not zero. It's a finite temperature. Anything above is allowed. But if you try to cross it, there is a new phases which try to arise. So this is what is happening. It's a new kind of third law of thermodynamics. So these are all some results which I have talked about in the last thing itself. So I will, propagators are also working out nicely. So I'm going to talk about the new things which are happening. So I wanted to see can, what, how can I do this for Dirac operators. Because I wanted to consider fermions, etc. for these problems. Answer is, yes, I can do that. But what is the Robin boundary condition in, for Dirac operator? It's a first order operator. Dirac operator is a first order operator, but involving many components. That first order operator boundary condition activity is known as what is called Akia patoni singer boundary condition, which is APS boundary condition, which is there. Now, we can generalize that APS boundary condition, in fact, uh, done by Bob and Co here, that you can generalize it by introducing a new mass parameter, more than what is there in the problem. And that mass parameter essentially is like length parameter. And that will tell you how many bound states are there. OK? Now, the interesting thing is when you talk about Dirac operator, the Dirac operator has both positive and negative eigenvalues. So negative eigenvalue is not a signal of uh, bound state. What is bound state is to be localized. And <coughs> the energy should be finite in number, both positive and negative. So this is a problem which we solved. Um, and the solution is what I'm going to do for the same exercise. The same exercise is the following. So the Dirac operator on R2 minus T. OK? So this is my Hamiltonian. And I have written it in polar coordinates. This is simple polar coordinates, where sigma r is here, sigma theta is here, and this is my Hamiltonian. I have introduced a mass for the Dirac particle. If you want, you can make it zero. It doesn't matter. So I have put this thing here. So I tried to solve this exercise. But unlike the conventional Laplacian, where angular momentum is there, we have to talk about spin angular momentum and orbital angular momentum. And the total angular momentum, j, is the one which is concerned, which is going to tell me that. So the total angular momentum is given by this, d theta and sigma 3. And this commutes with the Hamiltonian. So I'm going to express everything in terms of that. Because once I take care of the angular momentum, the equations become radial coordinates. The equation becomes two first order equations for the radial coordinates. I can talk about its boundary conditions. So this is the exercise. So this is one solution 
another solution which is there with spin up and spin down. This is the form of the solution. This is like e power i n theta which we have been writing, e power i n theta. And the generic solution for the function of r is here. So I write down the two first, first order equations and then make it into second order equation by the usual manipulation of differentiating once more. So this is the equation which we have. So this is exactly like the previous problem and I can now try to understand it in terms of uh, Robin boundary condition. And the way is here. This is one slide which I will explain very briefly now, which is you have a disk which is a boundary is a circle and the disk is uh, removed from there. So you have the boundary which is given by the circle. So what you have to do in this problem in APS boundary condition is the following. The, the thing is you have generic with the thing which is inner product is written down here, so I got a file. But there is an inner product in the bulk, there is an inner product on the boundary and that is what I have written down. The value of psi and phi is the value of psi and phi here at the boundary. So it's a function of only theta. These are only functions of theta. So what you want to know is whether I can make this equal to zero. That is h acting this way and the self adjoint acting this way. If I can, if it will be self adjoint if this is equal to this. It will be self adjoint if you. Now that is equivalent to the, the boundary term which is coming from here is exactly this. It's only a function of theta. Now I can do that provided I find an operator called k which anti-commutes with my sigma r because that is what is appearing here such that k square is greater than 0. So k in that case will have plus and minus eigenvalue something like chirality and if you restrict it to a space to only one part, only plus or minus then this will be automatically satisfied and that is the kind of a thing I should do. That is what ABS boundary condition which was given in conventional Akya Patavadi single condition. Now what if I apply this to this, this is my K R. The K is simply this which will commute, anti-commute with sigma R and uh, it will do the job. But you can, I can generalize this. The generalization is K bar mu is same as this with not this M naught, but mu. This operator will anti commute with uh, this operator. Now, this mu is a new parameter which I have introduced. It is like the kappa parameter which I have introduced in the previous problem, and I can look for how many bound states are there with this boundary condition. And that's what we did in this exercise. I'm going to explain. So, this is the condition like what you have here. It's a generalization of Robin boundary condition which you have for your problem and there exists number of bound states for this exercise also. So this is my result. In fact, again all the solutions are only Bessel functions. The problem is simple because I can do this same exercise in elliptical coordinates, curve linear coordinates also, but it's really not going to enhance my knowledge more. But the basic idea is there are solutions and there are finite number of bound states. They are localized, but the bound states will have both positive and negative energy because it is Dirac operator problem. The, it will have positive energy bound states and negative energy bound states depending on whether it has positive chirality or negative chirality. And the interesting result which will go with this is positive energy solutions go with negative chirality and negative energy solutions would go with positive chirality. That's a split that is taking place. It is something which can be applied in issues like topological insulators, quantum all effect, and other places where this kind of exercise is. So this is the result which is there. So this is what I have, in fact, uh, got as a new result, extending it to Dirac-like situation. But I wanted to do a little more. Yeah, you have 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, I wanted to do a little more. And what is it I wanted to do was uh, the following. The, what I wanted to do is, I wanted to consider the situation where the boundary is not stationary. It is moving. Okay. Now this is not new. We talk about moving mirror as a model for horizon. We talk about 
a situation of expanding, say, universe with, say, cosmological horizon, which is expanding. So this kind of moving mirror is physically interesting, and I should be able to solve that kind of quantum mechanical or quantum field theoretical exercise. Now there are new problems arise. Now if you say wave function is supposed to obey certain boundary condition at a particular time in order to make the Hamiltonian at that time to be self adjoint That's the condition we say. Now you say that wave function is going to obey certain boundary condition at, at time t, fiduciary time, and is self adjoint Now you if you want to find out how do I differentiate that function, wave function with respect to time, because my Schrodinger equation is d sub by dt, but d sub by dt is psi t plus delta t minus psi of t divided by delta t. But psi of t plus delta t obeys one boundary condition, psi of t obeys a different boundary condition, and how do I do that problem? So this is a tricky issue for which I have to enlarge my phase space, the Hilbert space itself, to go beyond. Or I can ask the question, can I do something different? Can I, that is a question which we ask physically, how do I get the boundary? We get the boundary even in Hall effect kind of problem by applying a potential. We apply some kind of a delta function kind of potential, and that's what. If that potential is there, and the potential is moving with time, Okay, then there is no problem. I can do a time dependent Hamiltonian problem. Or if I convert my other problem with manifold with boundary by making the boundary fixed but the time dependent goes into the Hamiltonian, that's also fine. So these are the ways in which we have been doing and that's what I'm going to explain now. So now <laughs> the interesting thing it was if I did the exercise for Dirac operator, okay something very interesting happens. Now the potential which I'm going to apply, okay, delta function potential to make the thing is not the only singular potential I can have. You can have a new potential which is interesting which I didn't know, that delta prime potential. Okay, a derivative of the delta function. And that is something which I learned when I was doing this exercise. So let us try to do the exercise for R2 minus disk. So this is my potential R2 minus this Laplacian. The potential is delta R minus Rb. It's a delta function. And I solve this problem. And the problem is easy to solve. It is uh, very simple. So this is the, you, what you do in delta function is find out the wave function before and write in the wave function after. They are continuous. The wave function is continuous. The derivative is not continuous. That is the condition which we apply here. This is the condition which talks about derivative is not continuous, the discontinuity is related to that. And I can solve the exercise and get the result. Identical with what I had earlier. Identical with what I had earlier. Now if I do this thing for Dirac operator, you remember Dirac operator is a first order. So the first order, okay, let me, the, this is a potential. The potential is a delta function potential. Now when I convert it to, to, to a second order equation, I'm going to differentiate my first order potential, which is delta of r. So delta prime will also automatically come. So I have to solve this kind of exercise uh, in a new situation. Singular point reductions for in delta x, what is required is, well, why we say that wave function is continuous, but derivative need not be continuous is we want the current to be continuous. There should be probability conservation. And the interesting result which was taken by Boya and Sudeshan, Sudeshan was instrumental with that, is can I have a situation in which wave function is not continuous, but derivative is continuous. And that is the kind of potential delta prime will give. So this is the thing which gives rise to delta prime potential the wave function is not continuous. Surprisingly, even though wave function is not continuous, probability is continuous because it is square. So instead of having this kind of a thing with exponential going this way and this way, you can have negative of that. The square of that will be nice, no problem. So this is a kind of exercise. And if you do that with delta function potential, I can solve my Dirac operator in this exercise. 
and I didn't even get this kind of a result which was okay. So I'm not going to explain that part because there has been a lot of uh, this thing. I'm going to focus on the issue of moving boundaries. Because why did I go to delta functions? Because I want to talk about moving boundaries. The so moving boundaries, for example, I go back to simple exercise. I have a pot B potential is zero, but it is from zero to LFT. Now the LFT is moving with time. It is moving with time. And I can convert this problem, for example, this kind of AT square. It has acceleration. It's not uniformly moving. It, I don't have a box which is uniformly moving with time. If it is then that it is, I can easily solve that problem. That's not a big deal. But if it is moving with acceleration, then the problem can be very interesting. I will tell you. This is the exercise. I have a delta function potential x minus AT square. I solve this exercise, okay? And it is easy to solve this exercise by making a unitary transformation of the wave function, and then this is my new Schrodinger equation within momentum uh, Fourier transform. Okay? But what interestingly happens is by this transformation, I have created a potential into the delta function is stationary, it doesn't move, but there is an extra potential which is given by like gravitational potential. It's a, see, this is the thing, if you have an accelerated frame, I can convert it to gravitational potential, and that is what is happening. So this solution is easy to find out because there are very functions. So I can solve the problem again, even in a case where there is a boundary which is moving with time. Okay, so now what can I do that for expanding disk? Okay. Answer is was actually uh, when I talked to Berry, that he visited, gave me this example. I have a Hamiltonian which is given here. That L here is a function of time, so it is expanding. So if I have a potential here, like a delta function which is moving with time, I can solve this thing by converting the whole problem into what I'm calling it as co-moving coordinates. Co-moving coordinates, in fact, it will be fantastic. No problem. I can solve the time dependent Hamiltonian problem in IC. So these are some exercises which I did, and uh, it, I can uh, actually I have done the issue of moving mirror by a very comp because if I wanted to do something like Schwarzschild black hole or BGC black hole to be considered as re replicated by moving mirror, the potential becomes the time dependence of the potential becomes a little more complicated. It's not uniform acceleration. It is more complicated, and one can do that kind of exercise, which produces for us the correct results. Now, I'm going to talk about two minutes. Okay, I'm going to talk about something which I've recently I bothered and I've done some work. At least I'll mention it. Now, the problem is about infrared photons. Okay. Now, what is a gauge invariance? Now. Are there new symmetries in QED which people have been missing earlier? Okay? These are issues which have recently have become worried about. And somehow I find that these are related to the questions which I have been worried about here. Now let me take as a simple example A0 is equal to 0. The gauge invariance is A mu is equal to A mu plus D mu lambda. That is as simple as electromagnetism QED. Now I say A0 is equal to 0. That simply means my gauge potential, the transformation which I'm going to do should be time independent. That lambda should be time independent. Now, del square lambda is equal to zero is the solution which I'm looking for. Now, if I want to make lambda is zero at infinity, the only solution is lambda is zero every day. Now, I want to have transformation which are uh, global gauge transformation. Which means I don't want to make lambda is constant at infinity. Okay? So I'm looking for such solutions for this where it is not a constant. So it becomes new thing, and I wanted to solve that kind of an exercise. They will all go like 1 by r square. That thing will be there always. So it will be always 0 because I want to have nice functions. But in order to understand the problem, I can regulate the theory in two ways. I can consider a big a large sphere and find out what is happening at that large sphere 
and then take that to infinity. That is one way. Or I can say, okay, let me give a very, very small mass to the photon. Okay, when I give this very small mass to the photon, then can I understand this problem? Answer is yes, I can do that, but I still want to have gauge invariance. How do I do that? I introduce Stuckelberg field. Stuckelberg field is you introduce one more field, mu is there, you introduce one more field, mu on phi, and then you introduce a gauge invariance, finally the Durant massive spin one theory is there. So you have a massive theory and also gauge invariance in the theory, so I can talk about this exercise. So finally it turns out in this thing that mass, I can take it to zero limit, at least in QED. I may not be able to do in QCD or thing. At least in QED, I can take it to that limit. And it is physically meaningful, because how do I know what is the mass of the photon? In order to fix that, I need two, conventionally in our, whatever physics I do, there are two natural scales in the world, in the universe. One is, to all the physics we know, is coming from ultraviolet scale, which is from Planck scale. Planck energy is an ultraviolet thing, in, which is essentially short distance. I cannot talk about distances less than 10 power minus 33 centimeters. Now, is there an infrared scale? Yes, size of the universe. It is the size of the universe. We know the, like, how long the universe has been living, at least from the Big Bang. So there is a size of the universe which has an upper limit. So even if mass is not, is exactly equal to zero, or gravity mass is exactly zero, we should somehow be able to understand it as a limit of slightly away, because there is no experiment in the world which is going to tell me that mass is exactly zero. Okay, mass is exactly zero, is not, never going to come. But if you only have a limit which is great, the length counter or wavelength is more than something. You can say it is galactic size or some other size, but that is the thing. So I want to understand the physics to be not so crucially dependent on that. If I want to have that, that limit should be the one thing which I'm bothered about. And this thing is, I can understand now, if I take a very large radius, or if I take them, m is very, very small, epsilon, away from zero, then one over epsilon gives me a scale. Then, if I consider a sphere of that radius, there are edge states coming from this, from exactly the same problem. And those transformations of those things, in the limit of m going to zero or r going to infinity, become zero, zero energy states on the surface. And there are transitions which I can talk, the transformation which I can talk about, which will tell me something interesting about this. So this is the work which I did, but which is not yet complete. So I'm going to conclude various things which I don't want to take time. Normal bound state solutions. I can explain some of issues. Class semi-classically, I can explain the entropy and Hawking radiation. And uh, various other issues I will not talk about it now. Uh, so these are the issues with papers which have already appeared. And there is some more work which is about the uh, uh, work with uh, Monos Casinano is about uh, the data function potentials. And this is my work on infrared photons which I am preparing now. So these are various people with whom I have talked about. And uh, I will stop here for any questions. Discussion. <coughs> This one or this one? Yeah, yeah. Hmm? Oh, this one. Okay, this one. Oh, so if I have this Hamiltonian x minus a t square, I do uh, it's a translation x is so I do this a t square, then this is the transformation leads to this too. The potential becomes delta of x. This is the same thing as here. And I have, this chi is related to, s this is my psi, which is coming from, there's I, one more transformation I have to do, because if I do this, then there is a u inverse dt u will come. So there will be a term involving p squared there, a p cube there. I have to cancel that. 
That term is cancelled by those extra. That's what is. Uh, what more translation I have to do? No, no, I am asking that why only the dairy function, the dairy functions come from the linear. Oh, dairy function. This is, no, the, this is a, this is like gravitational potential. Any functions are solutions for gravitational it's potential. Constant, right? Huh? It's constant. Constant. Gravitational potential is AX. Oh, sorry, AX. This is the mind. That's what I mean. AX size. AX size. AX size. Sorry, sorry. Typo. Typo. AX size. Actually, it is AX size. AX chi. So sorry, that is a. It's a gravitational. It's not constant here. MGX. MG is a, MG is a, sorry, it's a typo. So you have a particular model of boundaries, but in principle you could have boundaries which are oscillating. For sure, time. sure. So have you thought of applying this kind of a thing in warp geometries? Mm. You know, like the Randall Sundaram scenario with fluctuating boundaries. Yes. You are looking at that. I have not thought about it, but I have thought about the issue of making the boundary oscillate. That is what I have thought. But specific cases like Randall Sutra I have not thought. So three brains which yeah. have fluctuations. Yeah, I have not thought about the ex exact models where one may be interested. But this kind of issue with oscillation, where you introduce sine omega t or cos omega t and compare the scale of that omega compared to the scales which I have. Because most of the cases I have to apply adiabatic or uh, uh, sudden approximation, one of them. So I can compare that kind of thing. It may not be exactly solvable, but I can do that. Because I find that when you talk about the entire universe, uh, I think it's an open question, really, what the very large scale structure of the universe is. So to associate a scale with that is probably not as good as having a boundary. I mean, the good thing about warp geometries is that the boundaries are given to you. Yes. Right? There are, there are these three brains. Yes. And, and therefore, you could talk about fluctuating. So I I brought the issue of scale from the thing is only to tell what can be the mass of the photon or what can be the mass of the gravity. Right. So I looked into the literature where people have talked about things starting from showing their heads and they have also worried about and they have looked at the thing. So they essentially link the wavelength, this thing to something like galactic sizes or size of the solar system, etc. And that is a way in which the mass of the photon limit has been reduced. It should be less than this. But in principle, you can never say it is zero. That is the problem. Yeah. On that issue, uh, have you tried to do this for gravity? I guess Baal is going to Okay. Be okay. So, okay. so I, I, should, I, should I, I have not done, but I have some idea I mentioned. But uh, this is, people have been do, doing from gravity, from what people call the beam mass symmetry, asymptotic symmetries. Now, I, since I'm asking the question, can I put a mass for the gravity? There is no spontaneous symmetry breakdown mechanism for gravity mass, which was there. At least Tuckelberg can be done, or Higgs mechanism can be done. But off late in the last seven or eight years, there is some model which people... Massive gravity. Massive gravity. And that was very interesting. I didn't know this. One of my old friend from the TIFA days, you know Fawad Hassan? was student of our show. He has been in the forefront of doing this exercise. And people tell me I have got the thing and it looks like uh, substantially successful in the sense of people are attracted by that model. I have not gone through that. So it's only a question of can I put mass for the graviton? That is the question. So that is the issue. So let me get to something very basic conceptual. <coughs> you are doing the physics on the boundaries. Right? Now let's take the two fields, the electromagnetic field and gravity. Mm -hmm. Now, well, I mean the gravity and the rest of the field. Mm -hmm. Now here when you are putting a boundary in the case of the gravity, mm -hmm. because gravity is space-time. Space -time. Now, Putting a boundary on space-time in relation to gravity is a totally a different situation than putting a boundary for the rest of the physics, because where the space-time does not uh, bother the what happens. So, so I, I understand your question. I'm afraid today morning I was having chat with him. Okay, this is about uh, the question is if I gravity is space-time. And 
but that action it definitely makes graviton as massless. Okay, but what if you take Einstein's equations and probably let us say do a little more on that from experimental thing observational point of view? What is it I can say? So even the, according to him, which I also been learning, even the gravitational wave from the pattern which is seen there, it puts a limit on the graviton mass. It definitely puts a limit because the the modes they don't the free, the the dispersion less. It is dispersion less. All frequencies have the same. Uh, yes. So that is what. As predicted, it is yes. to the experimental accuracy which you can find is happening. And uh, that is what people claim as the what is the limit on the graviton mass. Now, if the so I want to understand a little more fundamental question. How do I know the graviton mass? Okay, say is zero or epsilon, which is slightly different from zero. That is the question. Now I see any day whenever you observationally operationally do the experiment, you will always tell me it is less than this number. Okay? You are not going to give me it is. No, 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 but I can I can put the question another way. Mm. That the graviton also have a zero mass. Yes. You 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 took the other scale is the size of the inverse. But what practical uh, purposes? Right, mm. and that size of the inverse is uh, very. Yes. Increasing. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, so if the inverse is expanding, the gravity must reach everywhere. So in principle, it ought, there should be a, some, it should be massless so that it's able to... I, I don't know what will happen after some time. Let us say that. No, but no. Do we know? No, if you decouple, no, the point is, in that case, that the boundary of the universe decouples from the rest of the physics, then there is nothing to worry, then nothing to talk about. I do not know about what is the future of the universe. Okay, let's. <laughs> it's a Tina.